Hello and thanks for accessing these I'm Curious About videos. In this episode, we hear from Reverend Nicolette Penyaranda, who's the ELCA's Director for African Descent Ministries. She shares with us about how congregations can make simple language choices to start to lean into deconstructing anti-blackness or the kind of language that constantly casts uh, things that are black or dark or in the night as negative, uh, and ways that we can really try to reclaim that. She was the illustrator for a children's book called God's Holy Darkness, uh, and we read that children's book together, but we have a really rich conversation with her uh, about simple things that congregations can do. So uh, I hope you enjoy this conversation with Reverend Nicolette Penyaranda from the ELCA Churchwide Organization. Well, welcome to our April uh, conversation I'm curious about. And tonight we are talking with uh, Reverend Nicolette Penyaranda, who's the ELCA's uh, Director for African Descent Ministries. And we are super excited that she's able to join us, though you'll see that she's uh, she's mid-travel. So we're going to make sure that she's able to keep her eyes on the road. But, um, but as we get started, um, given that just, I introduced you just with your title, but uh, Pastor Nicolette, can you just share with us a little bit about what that looks like? Like, what is what sorts of things do you do as the ELCA's director for African Descent Ministries? Absolutely. Uh, so first and foremost, hey y'all, so glad you're able to join this evening. And I want to apologize uh, because I'm traveling. I'm coming from a work meeting as we are um, working on our African Descent New Start cohort, which is specifically geared towards um, supporting and accompanying our uh, New Start ministries. We have about five that are in this cohort all across the country, and they are gathering with consultants and coaches, actually one being your very own, Reverend Michelle Townsend de Lopez, um, as a coach. And um, we had our, our meeting at Churchwide today. So thank you so much already for your grace. Um, but that also is just a little bit of what I do. So I understand my role as accompanying African descent communities, congregations, and leaders. So that looks like all people's gathering in um, Milwaukee, Cross Lutheran in Milwaukee, as well as, you know, sitting along pastors that may not necessarily be um, African descent pastors that may not be in African descent congregations. And so what my role, I, I think a tangible way of looking at my role is that as we're listening to the community, seeing what they need, we're also trying to plan for how we can um, strengthen our community and support our community. Uh, I would say a lot of our ethnic specific ministries, we really thrive in community together, um, especially being a smaller demographic in the ELCA. So uh, it's just one of the many joys that I get to do. Excellent. Thank you so much. Well, we are going to start tonight um, with, and, and uh, Pastor Nicolette and I uh, talked a little bit about how we were going to shape this conversation. And we're going to start with a quote and then a children's story. How often do you get to start a great conversation like this with a kid's story? Um, so the quote to help kind of frame our time is actually a sociological concept. And uh, Pastor Nicolette and I found out the other day that we share that in our background, studying sociology. And she loved this quote. Um, and it's one that, that I've thought a lot about, too. The quote is this, words create worlds. Words create worlds. Um, and what that means in sociology, psychology, and all of that is that the way we speak helps create culture. It helps create all sorts of things about our world. And that's a really important concept we decided to ground tonight's conversation in because of the book that we're about to read that Nicolette uh, illustrated. And then we're going to open up into a much larger con conversation about how words create worlds. So Nicolette, do you want to share any thoughts on on why that particular phrase struck you the other day when we were talking about it? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, as mentioned, one of our one of my backgrounds is in uh, sociology, my undergraduate career, but uh, my freshman year of college, I went to school Wagner College in Staten Island. So I interned in the city at GLAD. Uh, if you're familiar, that is, um, I couldn't even tell you what the entire acronym is, but it is an LGBTQ uh, media company that has done tremendous work um, in creating, how do you say, um, creating representation in media and concentrating on um, queer affirming stories and, and even 
uh, crises that have happened. Point is, I got to intern in the um, in the faith component of the media company, and one of the first things I learned really early on was around language. And my, one of my roles was to actually reach out to people and ask them to correct their language. And this was because they had done some research and survey had showed that people responded to like the term like homosexual worse than gay or lesbian. So if you used gay or lesbian in media and content, it was probably more well received than the term homosexual. This is the example I wanted to offer. Um, but it reinforces that like what we say impacts um, people, which in itself, there's a whole lot more to that. But I thought this was just such a tangible example of like, just by simply changing our language to words that more or less means very similar things, right? You change the way people see, um, feel, receive information. Um, and in the same in the same breath too, is that words also mean different things to different people, even though there's a definition. And that also um, impacts how we view, receive, and um, experience the world. So that's kind of what uh, really resonated with me with that particular quote. Awesome. Um, thank you very much. So as promised, we are going to start by sharing the book that we're talking about tonight. Um, and of course, we're talking about something much larger than a book. We're talking about that call to shift language um, and thus change culture in the church even. So the book that uh, Nicolette illustrated is called God's Holy Darkness. And Shar Giuliani, who is uh, with the mission table, here in the Senate is going to read the words and I'll hold, hold the images up and we'll let this children's book set the tone for tonight. So again, name of the book is God's Holy Darkness. Okay. Darkness and blackness and night are too often compared to lightness and whiteness and day and found deficient. But let us name the beauty and goodness and holiness of darkness and blackness and night. God uses darkness and blackness and night to show love for the world. Creation began in the dark. In the beginning, darkness covered the face of the deep. Genesis 1, verses 1 and 2. God poured out love and brought all things into being. Creation is God's work done in holy darkness. When Abraham began to doubt God's promises, the Lord took him on a walk and pointed to the night sky. Look toward the heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. So shall your descendants be. Genesis chapter 15, verse 5. Later, Jacob wrestled all night with God and was changed forever. The beginning of the many nations and peoples of the Lord is the work of God's beautiful darkness. At midnight, the Lord passed over Egypt and set the people free. Samuel heard a small voice calling to him in the dark and, be and became a mighty prophet. When the temple was complete, King Solomon said, the Lord has said he would dwell in thick darkness. This is from 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 12. The Spirit of God dwells in the holy darkness where we are invited to be held in God's love. Angels appeared to the shepherds in the dark and told them of a baby in a manger. The disciples gathered with Jesus for the Holy Supper as the day turned to night. When Jesus died on the cross, the day went black from noon to three. Creation began in holy darkness, and our new lives as free people in Christ began in the darkness of the sky that day. God saved all creation, and it was the work of God's beautiful, good, and holy darkness. Rich black soil brings forth abundant life. Unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains just a single grain. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. John chapter 12, verse 24. 
The deep dark of the ocean holds more life than has ever been discovered. We are reminded of the size of God's creation through the boundless, beautiful black of outer space. From the beginning of creation to the stars in the night sky, we are shown God's love. In houses of worship with dark spaces for wonder, we are held in God's love. In the dark mm -hmm. soil and the deep sea, we are reminded of God's love. From the promise of peace made to the shepherds at night to the promise Jesus made on the cross, mm -hmm. these are the beautiful works of God's holy darkness. Thank you, Pastor Shar. So, Pastor Nicolette, um, can you share with us a little bit about why this book needed to exist? Why you felt like it was important to be a part of it? Why did it need to exist? Oh my gosh. My co-authors and I would tell you like several different things, but we're all like kind of saying the same thing. For me, I felt like this book needed to exist because I think there is a huge need to combat anti-Blackness in Christian spaces. And I, this book does that very subtly, but intentionally. I also think that there's a huge need for um, a diversity of scripture being honored. The thing that I think this book does really nicely, and again, I'm not the author, but what I think this book does really nicely is that it looks at different stories that like you probably read, but you wouldn't think twice about how darkness shows up in those stories. And oftentimes um, our liturgies, our scriptures are so concentrated on light, bright, white, um, anything else goes away. So I, I mean, it just even offers a different perspective, you know, even if you don't feel like it actually addresses anti-Blackness. Excellent, thank you. Can you share with us some examples of where you have seen congregations or pastors making intentional choices about language to try to shift away from anti-Blackness? Like kind of get into the, the nuts and bolts of how could a congregation start to do this? But where have you seen it? Yeah, um, so I think there's two parts to this that I, I feel are important. The first, I'll start with the story itself. Um, and that was one of my colleagues in Iowa uh, Pastor Carla Wilderberger, wonderful, wonderful human being, way more experienced in ministry than me. She has been such a big supporter of this book. And she actually called me maybe a month or so before December and was just like, hey, I am working on Christmas Eve. And of course she can do that because she's an interim y'all. So don't feel stressed. But she's like, I'm working on Christmas Eve. And I noticed that there, there is some you know, anti-Black and ableist language. And I'm wondering if you could help me with that. Now, because Carla's my friend, I'm like, absolutely. What are you seeing? And we called, we talked, we talked about uh, a piece of liturgy that had mentioned um, the lightness overcoming the dark and something with seeing. So what we settled on was that the language we would use would be around shadows. And then the second component to that was, um, instead of saying seeing or I've seen the Lord, it was um, to bear witness. And so it was a slight adjustment, but it did the same thing we wanted it to do, right? Um, but we changed the language in such a way that um, did not necessarily exclude particular groups or put down um, others. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, the cell the cell phone towers were failing us a little bit, but we got it now. We're I'm good. I'm so sorry. No worries. Yeah. Not your fault. <laughs> Not your fault at all. Um, so what would you see as some easy opportunities for congregations to lean into this? You know, we record these conversations. We're hoping that congregations will look at this later as well as those of us who are here tonight. What are some first steps that folks could take to, to begin to lean into this kind of intentionality? Absolutely. So I, I think there's a few things to it. And the first is like becoming aware of it. You know, it's one thing to say like, yes, we want to address X, Y, and Z, but if we're not actually aware of what we're trying to address, then um, we're going to constantly hit roadblocks or we're going to misuse things. 
the reason why I say it like that is because um, we've been so privileged to have people actually read the, the book and um, preach on the book, which is wonderful, right? And we have heard a lot of sermons completely get it wrong. And by completely getting it wrong, meaning they're missing the mark on it, which is why I kind of also said earlier about like, we like to think that this is addressing anti-Blackness, but it may not always hit that because if folks don't actually understand some of the rationale behind that. So um, when it comes to like, I, I'm using the term anti-Blackness, but I think there's a lot of different things that we can see in scripture um, that we can be working on. But for um, anti-Blackness in particular, what we're trying to address is the negative connotations that are associated with words that are often related to, again, Blackness or Black people, right, or Black culture. And that means us as individuals taking personal inventory and thinking about that stuff, right? Um, and then just trying to, like, continue to be cautious of it as we, you know, read the text. Um, for anyone that is doing reconciling in works, uh, or I'm sorry, reconciling in Christ kind of work, you may see this conversation with um, my old congregation did like the, the Our Father. Some folks just did not feel comfortable with Our Father, or even the Father terminology in um, different parts of, of the liturgy, right? And so like that was something that they realized, and to be intentional about it, um, or, you know, he, him language when referring to God, you know, things like that, right? So what they did, though, was that every week, right, they reviewed the scriptures or reviewed the bulletin and were really intentional about changing it and not changing it in a way where it completely loses all meaning, but changing it in a way that felt like this um, became more opening and welcoming, right, to more people. And I think that there's a lot of, like, I know that there's a lot of, like, tension with that because some people think, like, how dare you change, like, the word of God? And at the same time, these are often, like, just interpretations of other interpretations of other interpretations. Um, and when you get down to like the actual like Hebrew or Greek, what we're looking at doesn't even have like pronouns, for example. Yeah, I love that. It's, it's a good reminder that when we are reading an English translation, I know one of my professors in seminary, my Greek professor in seminary used to have this funny thing that he said, uh, where he would say all translators are liars. And that was his way of saying that anytime you translate, from one language to another, you're also translating from one culture to another, and you are missing things. Um, exactly. It, I'll just give a brief personal example. Like this seems to me like one of those things that once you see it, the goal is that you can't not see it, right? So, and we're often changed through relationship. A personal example for me is that the last congregation I served, the musician was Jewish. And when we would read from the book of John, and we would read that the Jews this and the Jews that, she would ask me about that. And so I started changing just a tiny bit to say like the Jewish leaders or the Judeans or whatever. Or then in the sermon, I would say, this is referring to the Jewish leaders at the time, not all Jews all the time everywhere, right? So like right. simple, one of those things that once you are changed in relationship, to hear how words affect other people, then hopefully you can't not see it in the future. Um, another example in the culture, I think that, um, do any of you watch Survivor? This is a big, you know, um, reality TV show. And forever, for all these seasons, the host, when it came time for the people to come in, he would go, come on in guys. Because we use the word guys for a group of people and his eyes were open to, no, that's not an accurate word and a very simple thing. Now he just says, come on in, that's it. Um, so I really appreciate you inviting us into these intentional language choices, specifically tonight around looking for anti-Blackness uh, and where that shows up. Yeah. Another thing that we talked about the other day that you wanted to share with us was like, can you tell us a little bit about what's been challenging about this project? Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. And if it's okay with you, I actually wanted to go back to the example you used and how that relates to words create worlds. So, um, and I think most of us can connect the dots here, but as you talked about the usage of um, the Jews, right? 
just that language has created um, anti-Semitism, like in Christian communities, because they say the Jews killed Jesus, not recognizing that like this is um, intercultural violence. <laughs> you know, like this is not um, this is not a body of people antagonizing a different body of people, right? This is something that was happening within community, and um, that kind of rhetoric, right, has impacted now generations upon generations of folks and how they perceive the Jewish community. Like, and, and so it just, to me, that just like strikes home right there of like, just because of that language that has completely created a whole other perspective and relationship um, to a, a community of people. Um, in terms of the actual question at hand though, when you said, what have been some challenges? And I think I kind of named it, um, I think I kind of named it just a second ago with um, people getting it wrong, right? Um, the whole thing about saying beautiful things happen in the dark is to challenge us to look at darkness as a good thing, as an okay thing, as a neutral thing. And again, we've heard scripture or sermons that have still kind of like doubled down on dark being bad or ugly or negative. This has actually happened um, on Ash Wednesday at my congregation. I led a like, um, I called it paint and sip. There was no sipping involved, but <laughs> I, I led this uh, devotion, which with charcoal and invited us to reflect on the Ash Wednesday scripture and create something. And someone did this huge black heart. And she explained that it was the emptiness and darkness that she felt you know, after um, this attack, um, she had a, a dog bite. And um, it was a really beautiful um, reflection, I guess. But the idea that she still equated that experience to blackness and darkness and negativity um, was like, man, we've done the book together. I preached this actually at church, right? <laughs> so um, that, that would be it. Yeah, excellent. Well, thank you so much for for kind of doing, not kind of, for full on doing double duty here uh, or triple duty as a parent, <laughs> as a, uh, you know, the, the director for African Descent Ministries and uh, tonight with us. And uh, we hope this video will be posted with some questions. So some folks will watch this later. And we hope that this conversation has spurred something in you about intentional language choices that happen in the congregation and how those words that we choose help create the worlds in our congregations. And um, Pastor Nicolette, thank you so much for your work illustrating that book and for your tireless work uh, inviting us all to continue to raise our own awareness uh, around the ways words shape communities. And one of the pastors there is in a very small white town. And he said that their congregation has been really intentional about removing or about making sure that every image that somebody sees when they walk into their church is something that feels welcoming to any person. And so he said they've got um, an image of Jesus, but it's done in brass so that there are no colors to associate necessarily so that just brought that to mind so um the one thing as we're talking about images of jesus and i really want to jump in because it's one of my favorite things that i learned in seminary um i got these like thank you i got some like first or fourth century accounts of like what people believe jesus to look like and one was by josephus and the image that was explained was um, several things. And I actually didn't tell all peoples, but um, so they said like Jesus was like four and a half cubits tall or something like that, meaning, or three and a half cubits tall. He was like barely five feet, right? Um, the part in the center is very <laughs> Nazareth, but they said he was balding and he had a patchy beard, right? So like this man is not gifted in many ways. He has these bushy eyebrows, this huge nose. And um, the one thing added to him was um, he was a stonemason, not a carpenter. And as a stonemason, he was hunched forward a lot. 
So they actually suggest that Jesus would have been hunchback. Um, and this is significant because the crucifixion, right? Um, people are actually supposed to suffer there for days, but Jesus died almost instantly. And they argue because he was stretched back, which made it hard for him to breathe because of how his body was actually shaped. Um, and he was like, very like bronzy reddish. Um, the reason why I give that description is because that image of Jesus is obviously very different from the Apollo Jesus that we know, but we're now hearing about a disabled Jesus, an ugly Jesus, a short Jesus, right? These are all things that we don't necessarily associate with the beauty standard. Um, and we're not even getting into his complexion, but like how raw I, in my head. Yes. Can you give me one second? Just how raw is it of an idea that like the person that we consider our savior, right, was not attractive. And that in itself, like, changes how we relate um, or connect with like Jesus. And so the idea of showing different images of Jesus, even just complexion wise, is super radical. But like, I would love to see us showing more like different body Jesuses as well, because like, that opens a whole other variety of how we connect to scripture, how we, you know, um, even think of these stories and how people actually perceived him when he was walking in and whether he was actually welcomed or unwelcomed, et cetera. It's not just the words we use, it's our body language, it's the imagery, it's everything that we do. And we have to put our shoulders back and put our chest out and put our heads up and say it like we mean it. Like when we're reading those verses that we all mess up all of the cities and the names and stuff, but we still get through it and we just go for it. That's what we have to do with this. And, and you, as my Caucasian brothers and sisters, you have to challenge our other Caucasian brothers and sisters. You can't just sit back and be like, well, they'll get it someday. Today is the day. You are the one. Now is the time. I'm just going to say, you see people like nodding along. I was just going to ask, anybody else feel like you've been to church? When she's like, now is the time. I'm like, I'm not making light of that. Sonia, you just invited us into, it's not somebody else that's got to do this. It's us. It's not some other time. It's now. Like, if you've got little kids in your life, buy a copy of this book. I'm not just hawking the book for Pastor Nick, but because you can help them see something different. Um, I'm really encouraged by those of you who are here tonight because each of you knows somebody else who will listen to you, right? So Sonia, I appreciate the, now is the time. We need to keep hearing it and I'm grateful for it. Thank you. Um, I would love, I'm sorry, cause I'm recognizing it's 727. Um, I wanna give you some really tangible things you can do. Um, so, because I, I think, Pastor Matt, you said it really nicely that there's people that are going to listen to you, but there's also a lot of people that won't. Um, and that's okay. But what would it look like if you talked with your pastor about doing like a month summer series or something like that on a Sunday, right? Four weeks um, of just like using the language that we're talking about here in a positive light and concentrating on those stories and like doing crafts with your, thank you so much, babe. Doing crafts with your church that like concentrate that or concentrate on that or, um, you know, having just like, not even like a super long Bible study or anything, but just something that just celebrates it without even having to go deep into detail. Like, take it and do something for four weeks. What would that look like? And how would that impact the congregation? And depending on how that goes, push it a little further. Um, but just like easy steps. 